Okay, everybody, we're back. And so we're going to look at the next seven presidents. We've had some very famous presidents that we've been talking about um, in the past couple of videos with regard to you know, Lincoln and, well, I guess he's the only one who's famous. And then we had Johnson who basically, you know, self-imploded with the impeachment thing. And so now we're going to look at the next seven uh, real quick-like, like real quick-like, here in this video. There's going to be two videos this week. So let's get to it. The next president up on the list is President Grant. So U.S. Grant, last we, last we talked about him, he was uh, signing the treaty to end the Civil War. Well, well he was signing the, the cessation of, of hostilities with Robert E. Lee there at Appomattox, Appomattox Courthouse. And uh, that's the last we heard of him. And now he's going to run for president. And so obviously Johnson's not going to get reelected. So in 1868, Grant's going, to, uh, Grant's going to become president. And you see there on the map, he's doing pretty well. Also notice on the map that Texas and Mississippi and Virginia uh, are in green. It's not because they didn't vote. It's be, well, yeah, it's because they didn't vote. Uh, it's not because they couldn't vote. No, that's true. They couldn't vote because they were still uh, they were still under reconstruction. They hadn't met the requirements to come back as a state yet. Also notice that everybody, everybody on the map had, not that you can see it from this camera here, but everybody on the map has their name, except for that one state smack in the middle that has the big old panhandle. Uh, it's, called, it's still called the Unorganized Territory. <laughs> eventually we'll get there, eventually we'll get there. Anyway, uh, President Grant. So his uh, campaign theme was, uh, let us have peace. And uh, there you go. And, and that resonated with the people because the, you know, the, all the years of the Civil War and then the whole debacle with Reconstruction and the impeachment and all this crazy stuff going on. And people said, you know what, we want a strong person who can just power us through. So that's why, they, uh, that's why he was elected. And President Grant, uh, he, he worked on some civil rights stuff. He uh, he wrote into he signed an executive order for Yellowstone to become the first national park, and let's see oh he he had some corruption in his government. Uh, President Grant was really big when it came to um, the spoil system. Not probably as big as Andrew Jackson was, but the spoil system. You remember that? That's where oh you voted for me, let me give you a job, uh, and let the government pay for it. And so Grant did a lot of that, and then he had uh, several of his uh, personal cabinet members, the, the president's cabinet, they resigned under some various scandals, and yeah, so it wasn't all roses. But he did; uh, he was reelected, so he did serve four, uh, eight years. So that was President Grant. Anything else you want to say about that guy? Nah. All right. Somebody who's not a president, probably not. No, oh, I know he wasn't a president. I'm just thinking in my head, would he have been a good president? I don't know. Anyway, Boss Tweed. So uh, William M. Tweed. I was going to say his middle name, but I couldn't remember it. Uh, boss, and we call him Boss Tweed uh, because he was the boss of New York City for several years. And when we say boss, we're talking about, you know, there's the governor and then there's the mayor. But we all know who really ran New York City during this time. And that was Boss Tweed. So uh, he, he was the owner of a bank or two, the owner or on the board of directors of several railroads. He owned construction companies, he owned hotels, he owned the newspaper, and if you start adding all those things up, let's see, he owned the press, he owned uh, where people live, he owned transportation, he owned banks, I mean, and then, well there you go. So if you own all of that kind of stuff, pretty much what you say goes. He would literally just have to go up and say, hey, I want you to run or you're, you're going to be the next mayor. And people would be like, OK. And, and he'd tell people, everybody vote for this guy. And then that guy would become the mayor. Why? Because Boss Tweed was the guy that gave people jobs, whether positive or negative. He was the guy that gave people jobs. And so all the immigrants who would come in and they, if they'd come into New York City, they would say, oh, have you met Boss Tweed? And then he'd say, hey, do this for me. I'll get you a job down here at the docks, or I'll get you a job you know, baking bread, or I'll get you a job doing whatever, because I own all these different companies. But you have to vote uh, Democratic. <sighs> Phone. I'll be right back. 
sorry for the disruption. So uh, he would give people he would give people jobs at, as long as they voted uh, Democrat. I said Democratic before. As long as they voted Democrat. And there you go. And so it's an interesting quote here that basically says, I mean, this guy, he was, you know, he was playing the system, but you kind of got to admire him for, you know, knowing all the, all the hoops and things to jump through. And well, there you go. Now he is going to get caught eventually um, funneling money to himself and or his buddies, and he is going to go to jail. Uh, some very famous uh, political cartoons that uh, his, uh, that uh, Thomas Nast, who's a political cartoonist, uh, for the New York Times uh, was was drawing these cartoons and Boss Tweed actually got upset with Thomas Nast and told him to quit drawing these cartoons of him because he said Boss Tweed and I'm paraphrasing he said basically hey man the people that that work for me they're <laughs> they're not smart enough to read they're all illiterate but they can understand cartoons so quit drawing cartoons of me um, so it was found out that Boss Tweed uh, was funneling money uh, there there were uh, there were examples of, uh, for example, one uh, one person who was uh, plastering the ceilings of a hotel or the jail. I don't remember what, but he was paid like 1.3 million dollars for two days of work, right? Another guy, a carpenter, you know, who's making cabinets, was paid uh, uh, over a million dollars to work for one month. Um, Oh, right, and so clearly what's going on is, you know, he's he's paying these people, but those people are getting kickbacks. Uh, Boss Tweed had several different uh, 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 committees and several different commissions, and it was shown that uh, people who were on these commissions wouldn't do one lick of work, but they would get kickbacks from all of this money that Boss Tweed was generating from the government, and he goes to jail. All right. So anyway, Boss Tweed. That's not to say that he's the only corrupt guy, and of course this is all during uh, Grant's administration here. Uh, the Credit Mobilier uh, scandal of 1872. Oh, okay, this is this is slick. Step one, own a railroad. Step two, own a railroad construction company. So uh, a construction company, that's somebody, you know, the people that lay out the track. Right. Step three, build the track and for your railroad and charge yourself an exorbitant fee to do that. So your railroad company, so I'm, let's see, your railroad company asks the railroad building company to build, to build track. The railroad building company charges lots and lots and lots of monies to the railroad to do that. Of course, you own both companies. And then when the bill comes to the railroad company, the final bill, then, the, then that final bill to the railroad company, the railroad company says, oh, hey, government, federal government, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is public railroad, so uh, we're going to allow it to be a public railroad, so you get to pick up the tab. Right? And so they could charge whatever they wanted and the federal government was going to pay pay uh, money for that. That's pretty slick. It was called the Credit Mobilier Scandal of 1872, and here we have a political cartoon of Uncle Sam catching these guys, and these guys are uh, dressed in their samurai uniforms, and they're about to commit Harry Carey or seppuku. Oh, look at them using Japanese words, seppuku, which is ritual suicide. Some of you right now are going to be like, that's what I'm going to put down on my comment about this video. Sapuku is Japanese ritual suicide. Because I know how y'all work. Uh, the Gilded Age. Okay, so, you know, the Golden Age, right? So the Golden Age where everything is coming up. I was going to say roses, but cold up, coming up golden roses. Um, and so we talk about the Golden Age of Rome, and the Golden Age of Greece, and the Golden Age of China, and the Golden Age of... Blah, 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 blah. And so the Golden Age of the United States, right? Well, kind of not. We call it the Gilded Age. And so the Gilded Age, oh, it's, it's really nice looking. But to gild something, to gild something in gold, you're cheating. 
All right, so to gild something means to take a very, very, very fine layer of gold, uh, kind of like aluminum foil, except take aluminum foil and make it thinner, thinner than aluminum foil, make it out of gold, and then take that gold foil and kind of wrap it around stuff. Well, from the audience's perspective, they can't tell that it's not solid gold. They can, they can see from their perspective that it, that is gold. So this wonderful gold statue of, looks like Buddha here, is uh, it's not all, it's not solid gold. It's just gilded. It's just layered on the very outside. You have gilded gold on, on the family Bibles. This whole, and you can actually see him putting down the, the layer of gold on top of that. So what, so, so what? Well, here's what's what. We call it the Gilded Age because it looks really, really pretty on the outside, but on the inside, it's just concrete, or it's just, you know, whatever it is. So the Gilded Age says it looks really good on the outside. Not so much on the inside. Mark Twain, there, there were people that, uh, that coined that phrase. Mark Twain uh, gets the most credit for, for uh, coining that phrase, the Gilded Age. So, pros and cons. Hey, we look really good during this time period. We have rapid economic growth. We have 60% real wage growth, which means when you count inflation, we're still making money compared to what we did before, as opposed to what's going on in the year 2020. Millions of immigrants are gonna come over here for a better life, and railroads, factories, mines are springing up everywhere. Okay, so everything looks really good. It looks really good, the Gilded Age. Actually, that would be the Golden Age, but we know it's the Gilded Age. Why? Because, here are the cons, the group, the haves and the have-nots, that space is getting bigger and bigger between the haves and the have-nots. I mean, we have racket, rapid economic growth, but who's getting that money, right? Corruption at all levels of government, not just New York City's boss Tweed, but all the way up to President Grant, Immigrants may live in abject poverty. They're coming over here, but they're starting with zero. And so the, the difference between poverty and abject poverty is that poverty is, you know, you're at the bottom of the food chain, you're at the bottom of the economic ladder there. Um, abject poverty means that, yeah, you're below that. Like you have zero, you have nothing. Like, like living under the bridge kind of poverty. Maybe even worse than that, just abject poverty. Um, over speculations lead to panics and markets and lead to depressions and this is we've covered this before and yeah here we go again all right so two uh, two presidential terms later grant is done and we have uh, our next election the compromise of 1877 uh, pre uh, Rutherford B Hayes is going to uh, go up against uh, Tilden uh, the Democrat and Tilden is going to win the popular vote. And then it's going to go into the House or into the Electoral College. And the Electoral College, oh man, Tilden misses it by one. He misses it by one. So he's one vote short. And people are like, no, 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 he, he, got the, he, he won the popular vote. How is that possible? How can he be one vote short in the Electoral College? I know, right? I know, 18, 1877, right? How can that be possible? And so they start, they start looking at the votes. They start doing recounts. And then Florida and Georgia, no, I'm sorry, Florida and Louisiana and South Carolina, they send in their recounts. Oh, wait, their recounts are different than their original counts. In fact, there's two, <laughs> there's two different versions of the voting. So which one do you go with, right? So <laughs> because you can't just have everybody re-vote. I mean, can you? No. No, you can't. No, you can't do that. So, which which series of numbers do you trust? Well, it came down to somebody's got to make a decision. President Grant's going to help out with this. He's going to kind of push for the Republican. And Rutherford B. Hayes, who was losing going in the door, he uh, he kind of there, there's a deal that is made uh, that Florida and South Carolina and Louisiana are going to support. President or or uh, the Republican uh, the Republican candidate Hayes, 
if he promises to stop all this reconstruction nonsense, to just end reconstruction. So Hayes becomes the new president. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> Fortunately, we've solved all these kind of problems in the year 2020. Oh, wait. You guys are watching this in the year 2021. I'm filming this like the week before Christmas, so it's still 2020 for me. Hey, how did we end the year? Was it good? Did we survive? Did we make it? It's the year 2021 for you guys. All right. Maybe I should start saying that. In the year 2021, it's kind of weird for me because I'm still two and a half weeks away. Okay. Rutherford B. Hayes, president number 19. I like this guy for a couple reasons. One, I'm actually related to him. I'm like his seventh cousin. But uh, two, okay, well, I mean, that right there tells you all you need to know, right? Must be a great guy. Uh, let's see. <laughs> a couple things. He is, as far as I know, he's the only president who uh, did not break a campaign promise. Now, he's, he also didn't make any campaign promises, but he didn't break any, so there you that counts. He also is the only president that... Uh, did not serve alcohol in the White House, right? He didn't serve any alcohol in the White House. His wife, uh, Lucy Hayes, um, she, uh, her, her nickname is Lemonade Lucy because uh, water, tea, or lemonade, that's what you got at the, at the White House when he, was, when he was in charge. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes, is, uh, one of his promises, is that he's only going to be president for uh, one term, and he's going to keep that promise. Well, so there, there was a promise there. Um, during his time period, he's going to push for civil rights legislation. Uh, this, he's going to try to get it on track. And so uh, ultimately, uh, his big contribution to the presidency was that he was a good guy. I mean, that, I mean, that's pretty much, there you go. He was a good guy. After big, strong U.S. grant and some of his scandals and all that kind of stuff, people were, people were like, ah, can't we just have a guy that we respect? And so... Hayes comes in, and he's going to be respected for four years, and then he's going to go away. All right, so let's see. I wonder if I grew my beard out like that, if I my beard. I'm not going to do that. Wait. The same hair? Ugh. Okay, moving on. Civil Rights Act of 1875. All right, okay, okay. Enacted during the Reconstruction era to guarantee African Americans equal treatment, equal treatment in public accommodations, public transportation, and to pro to prohibit exclusion from jury service. So, African Americans are allowed to 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 go into public accommodations, ride the public like railroads, and they can serve on juries. Right? That makes sense. The Fourteenth Amendment says equal protection under the law. Right? Excellent. Good for you. And then the Supreme Court ah, got hold of it and they said, well, actually, the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment says equal protection of the law, but it only applies to federal government stuff. It doesn't apply necessarily to the states. Not yet. It will. But it doesn't apply to the states and it doesn't apply to private companies. So... Um, this is kind of unconstitutional, this, the, uh, the uh, Act of 1875, it's unconstitutional. You can't force a public state-owned company or a privately-owned company, you can't force them to hire African-Americans. You can't force them to stop African-Americans or to allow African-Americans in the door. You can't do that. I know, I know. Um... And the 13th Amendment, so the 14th, that was the 14th Amendment, so the 13th Amendment eliminated slavery, but was, quote, not meant to prohibit racial discrimination in public accommodations. So the 13th Amendment, which says, no more slavery, the Supreme Court ruled, well, but it doesn't say you can't discriminate. So, when we get a ruling like that, then that is going to encourage the 
discriminators to continue in their evil practices. And so we have, and we mentioned sharecropping, kind of go down the list here, sharecropping. That's the, uh, when you have a poor person who's working on your farm and you charge them rent, which is actually more than what you're paying them. And so therefore they get deeper and deeper and deeper in debt and they can never get out. And so it's a type of slavery, uh, sharecropping. And so that's gonna be, I mean, ah. Literacy requirements when it comes to voting. Okay, well, it does say in the 15th Amendment that you can, that all people are allowed to, well, you can't, you can't be a woman, but uh, all, all citizens of the United States, not on female, can vote. Doesn't matter your, your color or your race or whatever. Um, however, it, some states are going to enact uh, requirements. So, for example, we're going to have a literacy requirement. For you, when you walk up to the door and you're like, okay, I want to vote, and they say, okay, well, we need you to make sure that you understand that you can read so that you're not, you're not just checking boxes and you, you have to be able to read these people's names. So we're going to give you a reading test real quick. Ah, uh, ah, uh, but here's the deal. They had different reading tests. You know how that works. You give somebody, you give the, the well, I'm just going to say it, right? You give the white person the... Uh, I like ice cream, and that's the sentence they have to read. And then you give the uh, the former slave or the freeman, uh, the African American voter, you give them a paragraph that comes out of a law book or a medical journal or something like that that has insanely tough uh, uh, words to read. Oh, sorry, you can't do that? Oh, no, I guess you're not literate, so you can't vote. I know you're sitting here thinking, is he making this up? I'm not making this up. Voter registration laws, similar idea that uh, not just literacy, but uh, other ways that you can disenfranchise African Americans from voting. Grandfather clauses. Oh, somebody argues and says, oh, wait, that's not fair. You can't, you can't have the white people get to read the easy one and the, and the blacks get to read the hard one. You should make everybody read the same. And then some of the states were like, okay, well, we're gonna grandfather clause Everybody who had a grandfather, hope you're paying attention, everybody who had a grandfather who could vote in 1860, everybody who had a grandfather who could vote in 1860 doesn't have to take the test. Everybody else has to take the test. So if you were white or black or whatever, so everybody gets the hard test. Well, unless you had a grandfather who could vote in 1860 which means all the whites didn't have to take the test. It's called the grandfather clause. We still have grandfather clauses today. Um, uh, so for example, um, uh, teachers who are older than me, they, they are on the 80 retirement system. Uh, and so that means that their age plus the number of years that they've taught, when you add it up to 80, when it adds up to 80, they can retire. When I came in, they moved it to 90. And so, um, so the law now says, uh, if you come in, your age and the number of teacher, uh, years that you've been teaching have to add up to 90 before you can retire, or before you get 65, or, if, or, or 65, whichever comes first. And so the people who came in before me, they are grandfather clause to the 80 rule. I'm on the 90 rule. Only like nine more years. <laughs> uh, poll taxes, there's another one. Poll taxes is uh, uh, you gotta pay tax but to vote. Man, you can't, that's, that's naughty, naughty, naughty. Here we have Uncle Sam, he's writing down the qualifications uh, to vote. And please note, may, you look at this when you pull up the PowerPoint, look at that, look what he's writing. First of all, he's writing it in, in Ebonics, and uh, it's an awful, awful. You got these guys down here, uh, the big minstrel jubilee with Mr. Lewis and Mr. Ernest, and you see on the, on the wings, that's what those guys look like, but they are dressed in blackface because you could make money as an actor dressed up in blackface. This is not the year 2021. This is, you know. Plessy versus Ferguson. 
Mm, for the purposes of AP U.S. history, for the purposes of U.S. history, um, this is a this is top ten cases that you need to know. So Plessy versus Ferguson is very Ferguson is very simple. The Fourteenth Amendment says uh, equal protection under the law. So people, uh, companies, and or states said we can make it if we can make it equal. If we separate people and we make it equal, then it's okay. Equal protection. We can still separate the races. We can have whites drinking out of this water fountain and blacks drinking out of this water fountain, and it's okay because they're equal water fountains. Now we know later that they weren't equal water fountains, or we have the black schools and the white schools. And so, equal protection. Separate is okay if they are equal. And how do we get that? How do we get that idea? Well, it comes from this Supreme Court case. So you have Mr. Plessy. Mm. Yep, on this side, Mr. Plessy. He is an octoroon. So let's see. So if you have, if your parents, one is black, one is white, that makes you a mulatto. If you, if you have three, three of your grandparents are white and one is black, that makes you a quadroon. And uh, using terms back in the 1800s and if you have seven of your great grandparents and one uh, who are white and one who, uh, of your great grandparents who is black then that makes you an octoroon so you are you are one eighth black mr plessy here is one eighth black and he's going to get on the train on the train down down Louisiana, uh, on the train, they had white cars and black cars, white car, white only cars, and then black cars. And so, you got to get. And so, he presented his license, and his license says that he was one eighth black, one eighth black. And uh, they said you can't ride in the white only car because you're not white only. You're only seven eighths white, so you got to ride in the back. And he argued. He said, N "No, that is not equal. That is not. That is not fair. That I have to sit in the back of the train, like in the back of the train." I know some of you are like Rosa Parks. No, nope, this is uh, 50 years before this, 60 years before this. Um, so he, uh, they're going to take this to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States says, "Well, the train gets there at the same time. I mean, ultimately." The train gets there at the same time, so therefore it is equal, and therefore it is okay to separate as long as everybody gets there at the same time. And I know you're going to argue, well, the front of the train gets there before the back of the train. Ah, but there you go. Now, the vote was 7 to 1 or 8 to 1. What do I have? It's 8 to 1. I think that I think somebody was actually gone that day, so I think it was, the vote was actually 7 to 1. But um, the point is that there was one justice who dissented. And dissent means that uh, he, he, he or she, but he disagreed with the with the uh, with what the Supreme Court says and so this is uh, Judge uh, Harlan John Marshall Harlan good name John Marshall John Marshall Harlan and and he's going to uh, he's going to say guys the Constitution is colorblind the Constitution does not see color what are you doing with Plessy versus Ferguson but anyway, there you go. Plus, versus Ferguson, that's going to be the Supreme Court case that's going to allow people to have black schools and white schools and black uh, restrooms and white restrooms and black water fountains and white water fountains in this case right here. Don't worry. It's going to be mostly overturned in like 50 years. The Chinese exclusion rule. That's an act. Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So we have the gold rush coming over. We're going to have the railroads come over. That's going to be in the next video. Um, and so we have lots, lots of activity going on in the West. And because there's lots of activity and we have lots of people and the gold and all that kind of crazy stuff and people, immigrants are going to come over. Well, the Chinese are going to take advantage of that. They're going to come over in droves and they're going to try to take a lot of jobs. And the argument here is that uh, the poor whites who are coming and <laughs> going over to California, they're like, whoa, 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 these immigrants are taking our jobs, specifically the Chinese immigrants. And so we need to stop the Chinese from coming over. 
So the Congress is going to pass a law that actually excludes the Chinese from, immigra uh, from immigration. It's going to be passed in 1882, and they're going to say, all right, China, for 10 years, you are not allowed to send anybody over. For 10 years. And then when that 10 years came up, then uh, they said, oh, we're going to actually extend that 10 more years because it's working out for us. And then when it came up again, they said, in 1902, they said, uh, you know what, we're just going to go ahead and make this permanent Chinese China, you cannot send any immigrants over here to the United States of America. And then that was the rule all the way up to 18, I'm sorry, 1943. So uh, right after, uh, or right in the middle of uh, World War II, we're gonna finally allow the Chinese to come back over. So for 70 years-ish, um, wow, right? <laughs> we banned China from coming over. And again, why? Well, the argument was they're taking, they're taking our jobs. And so here we have, a very famous uh, cartoon. We've got uh, the the white the white guys over here on out here, and they're they're lollygagging and they're uh, they're doing nothing. And you've got the the one Chinese guy here who has 17 different arms, and he's doing all of the jobs and taking it from the true Americans. Please note, I'm doing that sarcastically. All right, moving on. Our next president. James Garfield. Oh, look, he's got the thing with his hand. Look at that. James Garfield. Uh, James Garfield was president for 200 days. Renounced senatorial courtesy. All right, so that's a big deal, right? Senatorial courtesy is when the president, the new president comes in and the senators who, let's say, uh, okay, so he's a Republican, and the senator, the the senator, so he's, he's the Republican president, and the Republican senators are going to go up to him and say, hey, you know, we helped you become elected, and I've got a cousin who would love to be a judge, and the president's like, oh, yeah, just give me his name. I'll sign him, and he'll become a judge. That's senatorial courtesy. And uh, Garfield says, uh, let's stop that. Let, let's just let's stop that. Um, he went after corruption in the U.S. Post Office, and he's going to strengthen the Navy, and then he's going to start trying to work on some civil service reform, and everything is going to be look, you know, going to be great. And then he goes to the train station, and uh, he's there on the platform, and uh, not so much. We have an assassin. Uh, his name is Charles Guiteau. I like to call him Chucky. Uh, Charles Guiteau was was hoping to get a job uh, because of his buddy who was in was in uh, the government and when the president said well I'm not doing that anymore you, you actually have to earn your job well Chucky got really upset with that and so he showed up on the train platform with a pistol and he shot the president uh, twice he shot him in his arm and shot him in his gut uh, interestingly enough uh, the president was accompanied by, let's see, uh, James Blaine, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of War, whose name is Robert Todd Lincoln. Yes, that's right. It's Lincoln's son. And you say to yourself, well, wh what? Where are the, where are the Secret Service? Where's, uh, where's the, okay, well, we, we still didn't really have a Secret Service. I mean, bodyguards maybe, but not even here. Because... Well, I mean, you know, assassination. I mean, Lincoln was assassinated, but that was just like crazy actor. I mean, it's never going to happen again. Well, now this is our second president who's been assassinated. So, Secret Service, anybody? All right. Uh, Garfield, Garfield uh, lived for 11 weeks, but then died, you know, because of the bullet and sepsis and gangrene and all that. Anyway, he died uh, 11 weeks later. 200 days. Chester A. Arthur is going to take over uh, for uh, <laughs> Garfield. That's that would be funny in a little bit. Uh, Chester A. Arthur is going to take over number twenty-one, and Arthur is going to uh, sign into the into law the Pendleton Act. So the Pendleton Act. All right. So let's see. Mandatory campaign contributions by federal employees is illegal. So there used to be a rule that said if you if you were a federal employee on your paycheck, they would take a couple of dollars out of your paycheck that goes into federal campaign, you know, like the presidential campaigns, and there's nothing you could do about it. And you're thinking, well, that's not right. I know it's not right. And so he uh, he's going to say no. We, let's get rid of that. Now today in the year 2021. Uh, you can sign like on your on your IRS tax form that you have to turn in by April 15th. 
there's a little box somewhere in like the bottom of the second page of the easy form that says, would you like to contribute to the presidential campaign? And you can check there, it'll cost you two bucks or whatever, you can chip in, but I wonder how many people actually do that, I don't know. Civil Service Commission created to make federal jobs based on merit. Wait, so it's what, it's, it's what your resume looks like and not who you know? Huh, that seems like that's a good idea. Vetoed legislation the government couldn't afford. Is everybody sitting down for this? Arthur said, I mean, he, he looked at, he looked at the, the bank account, the United States bank account, and the Congress is passing legislation, and Arthur goes, okay, how much is that going to cost? Uh, okay, we have money for that. Well, how much is that going to cost? Oh, no, we don't have money for that. I'm going to veto that. president vetoing stuff because it costs too much in fact he vetoed so much stuff that we made money we actually made money we had a surplus of money right a surplus of money and he got yelled at by some of his buddies because we had too much money we our surplus was too big Uh, Mark Twain says, it would be hard indeed to better Arthur's administration. Our next guy, Grover Cleveland. Yes, we did have a president named Grover. Who's the only other Grover you can name? Oh, wait, no, there's the, okay, so obviously the puppet. And then there's the, 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 uh, uh, the, the from the, the, you know, the book. <laughs> the, the fawn. The, yeah, right? The fawn? Is he a fawn? Is it satyr? I don't know. Anyway, he's from Percy Jackson. Ah, see, if I stumble around enough, I'll get it. Grover, Grover. You think of another Grover? No. First Democrat president of the United States since the Civil War. Oh, okay. First of all, uh, I guess I need to explain that. He is number 22 and number 24. President number 22 and number 24. That's right. First Democrat president uh, since the Civil War. All these other guys we've been talking about just blowing through. They're Republican. And so here we have a Democrat. Known for his honesty and integrity, he's going to push for the gold standard to get off, the sil get off silver because he thinks silver is just is running rampant. And then we've got lots of silver just out there. And so if we just stay focused on the gold standard, then inflation won't get too crazy. He's going to reduce tariffs, update the military. Uh, Grover's not big on uh, expanding uh, out onto islands and or into the like into the Caribbean. Uh, he's not a big fan of imperialism. <sighs> Grover does have a downside. He wasn't. He looked at the Fifteenth Amendment. And he's like, okay, right. The Fifteenth Amendment says that people. It doesn't matter what color you are. You can vote unless you're a female. Um, and he thought, eh, it's just not working. And so he did not push for enforcement of the 15th Amendment. So he, so during his time period, we had a lot of the grandfather clauses and literacy, uh, literacy issues and poll taxes to keep the blacks from voting. And he's going to encourage assimilation through the Dawes Act. If, you're, if you paid attention to your Oklahoma history, you know all about the Dawes Act with regard to assimilating the Indians. I think we talk about that a little bit in the next video. Grover had some, I just want to point out this really interesting idea that Grover had. This is the Texas, there was a drop, a, a drop, a dropped. Texas didn't have a lot of rain one year. And Congress passes a bill to give $10,000, woo, $10,000 to Texas to buy seed. Grover vetoed, President Cleveland, I mean, I mean, how often do you actually get to say Grover? So, President Cleveland uh, vetoed this. And in his veto, he writes the following. He says, and I highlight it here in orange, he says, To the end that the lesson should be constantly enforced that, though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. The people should support the, should support the government, but the government should not necessarily support the people. That's the President of the United States talking. Now, if you read further down that list, he says, no, 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 things like this, like the drought, the people, the neighbors should help neighbors. People should help people, not the government. Because he says, if the government starts to do this, starts to bail people out, well, then people are going to start expecting the government to bail, bail them out after every single natural disaster. And uh, Grover says, that's not going to be good on our pocketbook. 
Huh. I wonder how that is in the year 2021 that the government bails us out. Huh. I guess I'll find out when I get there. Benjamin Harrison, number 23. All right, uh, Benjamin Harrison committed to uh, committed to enforcing the 15th Amendment. So we're going to go, we're going to backpedal, and we're going to he's really going to try to do this. McKinley tariff significantly raises tariffs and hurts farmers. Ah. Oh, pensions for Civil War veterans. So a pension is you uh, is like a Social Security. Well, it's not, it's not Social Security. It's it's a you get well, it's kind of like Social Security. You get paid for being part of the ar- you know in the army. You get a pension. Um, we have a teacher's pension in in Oklahoma that uh, when I retire, you get Social Security and then you get a little you get teacher's retirement. Um, <laughs> if, we, if I make it that long. Uh, so pension for Civil War veterans, and you're sitting here thinking, wait, how many presidents has this been since we've had a Civil War? Right. First Congress to spend one billion dollars in a single year. One billion dollar. One billion dollars. How's that? How's that compared to today? Well, let's see. Again, this is a December. Well, December sixteenth. Uh, the week before Christmas here, and Nancy and Chuck and Mitch um, are all trying to figure out should it be 1.9 trillion or should it be 2.2 trillion? Trillion. For one little bill, that's not a little bill, but one bill, one billion with a B. Yeah. It's a different world we live in. Signed the Sherman, oh, okay, signed, signed the annexation, okay, sent federal troops to Wounded Knee in South Dakota. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Signed annexation of Hawaii. So we're, Hawaii's not going to be a state yet, but it's, we're going to annex it as a territory. And, you know, interestingly enough, they have a really deep harbor over there. It's called Pearl Harbor. And we could probably establish a naval base over there at Pearl Harbor. Sign the anti uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act. We'll look at that later. All right. During uh, <clears throat> during this time, we're going to have a third political party pop up. So we have the Republicans, the Democrats, and then the populists. So let's go down real quick through the populists. This is this is what the populists wanted. And so, okay. So uh, let's see. This is basically frustrated farmers in the South and the West. And here's their platform: a graduated income tax. Oh man, in a <laughs> They beat government. We're going to argue about this. So graduated in- income tax is a very simple idea. Well, it's simple, but the, the less you, the more you make, the more you make, the more percentage you pay. So if somebody makes ten dollars, uh, then for taxes they're going to pay one dollar. If somebody makes a hundred dollars, well, then you think, well, a hundred dollars, then they pay ten. No, they're going to pay fifteen. So they actually pay us a, a higher percentage. If somebody makes a thousand dollars, you say, well, the tax on that would be a hundred or one hundred and fifty. No, they're going to pay two hundred. And so the more money you make, the more taxes you have to pay percentage-wise. And so whether you agree with that or not, uh, that's that comes from the populist party. Government ownership of railroads and telegraphs. So today that would be the same thing as saying the government would own the phone companies. Well. The populists would argue that means that the government sets the price, and the all of them can't compete with each other, you know, and and, and play you know price wars. The government sets the price. Positives, negatives. We'll talk about it Direct, uh, next year in AP government. Uh, direct election of U.S. senators. Oh, okay. So the uh, election of U.S. senators. The Constitution says that. Uh, we vote for the House of Representatives, but we don't vote for the senators. I know, right? We vote for our state legislators who then vote for the senators. That's in the Constitution originally. And now here in the year 2021, uh, it's been changed. It was changed a long time ago. And now we do have a direct election of the senators. But back then, the Populist Party was the one that came up with this idea. One term limit for the President of the United States. Initiative and referendum reform. Initiative is when the people of the state say, we want to pass this law. And, and the, you don't need the governor's permission. You don't need the, house, the, the legislature's permission. If you get enough people to sign uh, the petition, then that's going to be put on the ballot and the state will vote for it. Well, state 
will vote on it. So the people can come up with their own laws. Uh, we do have that in our state, and uh, we have done that a couple of times. Referendum is kind of the, the opposite of that. There's a, there's a law out there that we don't like, or there's a person out there that we want to get rid of. And so the people can form a petition, and we can sign that if we have enough votes, and then we can all vote on whether we want to get rid of the law or get rid of a person. So that's a referendum. And again, we uh, in our state we have that because we are a pop. Well, we certainly were a populist state. And uh, there you go. That's not not in all states. Can they do that? Shorter work days, unlimited silver coinage, and immigration restrictions. Why the populist party failed? Well, blacks couldn't vote in the South. I mean, they could, but because of all the different disenfranchising weapons that some of the people used against the blacks to get them to not vote, there you go. And so all of these things, the vast majority of these things here would are pro-African-American, right? Pro-African-American. But uh, it's going to fall apart. So we're not going to have the Populist Party as a major political party um, more than just a little bit. And again... In our particular state, um, it actually caught traction and uh, it became, as we say, popular in a populist party. All right. Grover. Grover's back. He's the only president to do this, to be president, then to not be president, and then to be president again. So he's the only president to do this. Uh, there you go. Uh, he's going to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890, and he's going to pass other tariffs. Um, this last one, Cleveland passed the Wilson-Gorman Tariff of 1894 that lowered tariffs and put a 2% tax on income. Income tax? Income tax. Supreme Court of the United States in 1885 says that is unconstitutional. You cannot have an income tax. Ooh, it's too bad. <laughs> All of you who are working, all of you who are working, have you looked? Have you looked at your receipt? You know your tax, your whatever. And you're like, who's this FICA? Who is this? Ah, that, there you go. Didn't stick. Let's play a game, shall we? I just covered seven presidents. How many can you name right now that I've just covered? Right. So we had the war veteran. Then we had the guy that didn't serve alcohol. Then we had the guy at the train station. Then we had the guy that uh, pushed for civil, civil uh, for voting issues. We made a guy who didn't like the voting issues. Then we had the guy whose name was a puppet. <laughs> then we, right? So this is why we call them the forgettable presidents, because right now you're sitting here thinking, I can only name like two of them, or maybe three of them. Does anybody right now remember the guy who served lemonade in the, in the White House? The one who I'm related to? Are you shouting at, at me right now going, yes, Jones! No, that's not right. It's Hayes. All right, we're going to, yeah, we're going to stop, we're going to stop right here for the first video, and we're going to start the next one here in just a little bit, and uh, see you guys on the flip side. Be good.